And then afterwards, I said, after I said yes, he goes, there's some tough words in there, so you might struggle a little bit. I'm like, okay, thanks. Love you too. So, so here we go. <laughs> so here is um, Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 19. Jesus withdrew with, with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that he might be with him, or so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. All right, so um, a lot of people who start a business often run into the problem where it's like, how do, we, how do we scale this and make this larger and more impactful? For example, um, I'm going to start a handmade soap business. It's, it's my, my new thing. Right, and so what, what often happens is, is as I start making this soap, because everybody needs my soap, and, and I, right, business starts to grow, and after a few weeks and months, it gets to the point where I can only make so much soap, and I'm getting more orders than I can keep up with. So I have to hire somebody to join me, and now I'm able to effectively double the amount of soap that I can make. And then as more orders come in, I hire more and more people, and over time, my role becomes less about making soap and more about training and managing other people to make soap. And that's how I'm going to become extremely wealthy and make the world smell a little bit better. Uh, now I know that's kind of a ridiculous example because um, nobody can see me actually making soap. But do you realize that Google, um, Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon were all started out of somebody's garage? And, micro, er, and Facebook was started in a Harvard dorm room? And now those companies basically control the entire world. Uh, right? But they all started off really small, but they, had, they all had two things in common. One, they had a product that people really wanted, and two, they had a business model that allowed them to scale up pretty much infinitely. And when we look at ministry, a lot of people get really weirded out when we compare ministry to business, and I get it, right? If we make ministry about money, we're not doing ministry anymore. Then it just becomes a business. But there are still a lot of lessons that can be learned. And we look at the way that Jesus modeled his ministry for us and the way that he set up his church it's basically, it's one, he has a product that everyone needs, which is eternal life. And two, he created a model that is replicatable and infinitely scalable. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Um, so we're going to jump right in. So hopefully you already have your Bibles open. Um, so we're Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 7. And Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, being the Sea of Galilee. And a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea, Jerusalem and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. Which, by the way, when I, when I, I had to coach my wife last night on how to say some of these words. And the key is that if you just say it with confidence, nobody will ever question whether you get it right or not. If you're ever reading the Bible and you don't know how to say something, just make it sound like you do. 
and you'll be good. Um, right? And when, when that great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he t- told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. And he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. Right? So there's, there's literally so many people that are coming to see Jesus that he's literally concerned for his own safety that they're going, like these crowds are going to just like stampede over him. Um, and this is actually really, it's a, what we're seeing here is just accumulation of everything that's been happening so far in the Gospels. That the more Jesus heals people, the more he preaches, the more miracles he performs, the larger and larger these crowds get. Um, And it's not stated in the text, but I think we can infer based on Jesus' response that this crowd was not there for the right reasons. Jesus was looking for people with faith. The crowds were gathering hoping to see a miracle or maybe to get some free food out of there. Um, When we continue on in, (coughs) excuse me, in verses 11 and 12, and whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Now we've seen this before as well. This, uh, we talked quite a bit about this at the end of chapter one, that Jesus keeps telling people, he's like, no, don't, don't, like, you're the son of God. And he's like, shh, don't tell anybody. It's a secret. And we're like, why would you want to keep that a secret? Um, and especially in the case of the demons, I think the safest answer is the fact that Jesus doesn't want his reputation proceeding from demons. That's not exactly good PR, um, right? You, you got to kind of question the source there, right? He wants people to know who he is based on what he's teaching, not off of what somebody with a demon said about him. Uh, but so we see here, Jesus is, is he's surrounded by a lot of people, right? And the more he does, the more people want to see him. But it's interesting, whenever large, crowd, large crowds start to gather, Jesus oftentimes tries to get away from them, right? He'll, he'll do like, in this case, he's like, hey, make sure you have a boat ready because we need to make an escape. Or he'll go like hide somewhere in the mountains to get by himself for a while. Or sometimes he'll just try to disperse the crowds by saying something crazy like, eat my body and drink my blood. And everyone's like, oh, this guy's weird. We're out of here. Right. Um, I heard one pastor put it this way. Jesus is there for the people, not for the crowds. Right? There's, there's a big difference. Jesus came to save lost souls. He came to heal people that were sick. He came to meet people where they're at and bring them to God. He did not come to become a celebrity or an influencer. There's, right, uh, we see... Uh, in our culture today, we have this fascination with like celebrity worship, whether it be an actor or an athlete or now like TikTok stars. I, I don't get it. Um, right? But we just, we become so obsessed with these people that we see on TV or like we, we follow, like these, these people, like we look at them as if they're our friends even though we've never met them before. And so there's magazines that will literally violate these people's privacy just to get a headline or to take a photo of them when they happen to not have their makeup on and things like that. We, we, even worse, we make reality shows out of these people because, right, think about it. Your life's pretty bad. If you, ha- if, if you don't enjoy your life enough that you have to go watch somebody else live their life, that's, that's a sad state, right? But unfortunately, this celebrity worship s- has spilled into the church quite a bit, right? And so we've got preachers that have make millions of dollars off of book sales and will preach to, to thousands of people but yet won't take the time to actually sit down with somebody and pray for them. Or if you actually try to go talk to them, they have a security team that won't even let you get close, right? It's terrible. But if you do get too close, I will have Adam arrest you, just so you know. So keep your distance. Uh. <laughs> right, but that's, that's not Jesus. Jesus seems to be running away from the crowds, but he's constantly interacting with people right where they're at. Like I said, Jesus is looking for the people that have genuine faith. He's not looking to become a celebrity. He's not looking just to draw, draw a big crowd to say, look at how many people I preach to. Um, another thing that we see out of this text is that we have a, a, a problem for Jesus. 
in that there's too many people for him to effectively minister to. He has reached the, the capacity for one person to, to actually interact with that many people on a regular basis. And I know Jesus is God and he's all-powerful, but he's also human. And so in the incarnation, meaning when, when Jesus took on human flesh on that first Christmas, he chose to confine himself and to limit himself to the constraints of time and space. Meaning just like you and me, Jesus could only be in one place at one time. And that automatically puts a limit as to how much you are able to get done and how many people you are going to reach. And if Jesus came to save the world, how is one person supposed to reach the entire world? And the answer to that problem lies in the next several verses. Let's start reading again in verse 13. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve whom he also called apostles. That phrase isn't going to actually apply until later on after the the resurrection. Uh, So that he might be with him, or they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. And he appointed the twelve. And we'll get to the actual twelve in just a minute. A couple things to note. Um, One, it says that he called them. We dove into this several weeks ago when we talked about the calling of the first four apostles. Discipleship and and having followers was a normal part of their culture. But Jesus broke a lot of the norms by by specifically choosing the people whom he wanted to follow him. Normally, it was always the student who approached the teacher, and Jesus turned it around, and he sought after the people that he wanted to follow him. The second is it says... They call them the, the, the 12. Um, so the word disciple means a follower or a student. And an apostle is someone who is sent out. Um, they call the, tw- the or he, they're referred to as the 12, because there were 12 of them. That's a significant number. Um, in the Old Testament, right, the, the Old Covenant under, under Moses had 12 tribes. And so Jesus intentionally starts his church with 12 disciples. We have the Old Covenant and now the New Covenant, and he's showing the the similarities, but yet it's a break in a new covenant that he's starting with. We also see the 12 show up again in Revelation, so that number is significant. Um, Now, there are no more than that. Um, Some people have tried to teach that the, uh, the the authority of the apostles were handed down to other people, and so right, they would replace them as they died off. Um, that's where you get ba- that's the essential teaching behind the the Pope in Roman Catholicism. I know like Mormons have their own twelve apostles, um, and some of the more like extreme Pentecostal movements. We have like there's something called the New Apostolic Reformation that believes that there's still apostles who have the authority given directly from Christ. No. That is, none of that is biblical, right? There is no succession of power, right? We had the authority given to these 12 men, and then what we have are the writings that they left behind for us that carry that authority, right? So if anyone claims to, if you, if you come across somebody today that claims to be an apostle, that should be a big red flag that they're most likely a false teacher. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so, uh, the, the reason that he called them, he gives three in verses 14 and 15. First is that they might be with him, meaning they were going to live with him and travel with him. And so they're going to be learning to imitate him, not just in his teaching, but also in his walk. And that their whole goal was to learn how to replicate the life and teaching of Jesus in their own. The second thing is that they might preach. Again, this, this is how Jesus is going to resolve the problem. How can one man reach the entire world? Well, he trains up other people to go out and carry that message for him, which we'll look at in just a second. And the third one is that they might have the authority to cast out demons. Just as Jesus demonstrated his authority over the spiritual realm, he is now handing off that authority onto his apostles 
as well. And then another one that's not mentioned in this text, but that we'll see later on, is that these 12 are going to be the witnesses to his resurrection. That these are going to be the first ones that he, or these will be some of the people that he will appear to, um, to prove that he did rise from the grave. Now, Matthew and Luke also include lists of the 12 disciples, but if you line them up, you'll find that they're not exactly the same. Um, Some of the names are in different orders, and also some of the names are different, not because there's a different 12, um, but simply that most people back then would have a, a Greek name and a Hebrew name, and so you see the difference usually lies in that it's the same people that have more than one name, which we'll see in a second. But it's interesting that when you compare the three lists, um, you can kind of see that they're always listed in three groups of four people, implying that there may have been some kind of structure or order to the apostles as Jesus appointed them. Uh, but so let's, let's get into the actual list here. Um, just a warning. Um, for a lot of these, we're, we're going to talk about right, kind of briefly who they were and what they would go on to accomplish. Um, and to do this, we're going to have to move outside of the realm of right, authoritative scripture. Right? So if it's in the Bible, we believe that it's 100% true. Uh, but the book of Acts that records the history of the church uh, stops somewhere around 60 AD. So anything beyond that, we're going to have to move into the realm of tradition in some of the legends that were handed down to us from the early church. Um, And so some of these we might not be able to verify as 100% true, but I think we can still get pretty close. So the first one, it says, Simon, whom he gave the name Peter. It's literally Petros, which is the the Greek word for rock. And that's going to come from uh, in chapter 8 when he's going to say that you are the Christ. And Jesus is going to respond and says, on this rock... I am going to build my church. And so Peter is, without question, the leader of the 12. There's some evidence that might suggest that he was the oldest. He also really seemed to have the biggest personality out of all of the apostles, which if you read through the Gospels is very evident. Um, But Peter would go on to deny Jesus on the night that he was arrested, and Yet Jesus, after his resurrection, would forgive Peter and reinstate him. And he would, despite his major failures, he would still go on to be essentially the leader of the first church. And so Peter was the first person to preach the gospel to the Jews and to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, to to go out beyond the, the nation of Israel. And so history tells us that Peter started his ministry in Jerusalem, and then he moved on to Antioch in Corinth, and then made it all the way to the city of Rome, where he was eventually executed. Next, we see James, the son of Zebedee. Um, James, we're not told a ton about him in the Gospels, but James was the first person to die for his faith. He's also the only one of the apostles to have his death recorded in the, the book of Acts because he died in Jerusalem at the hands of the Jews somewhere around 40 AD. So he only got to minister for roughly seven-ish years. Um, but history tells us that in that time, he actually traveled all the way to Spain to proclaim the gospel. Um, next, we have John, the brother of James, and this is where it says, whom he gave the name Boanerges. I, like I said, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right. It's a Greek word. Um, but the word means the sons of thunder. That sons of thunder is a reference to basically their, their personalities or their, the tempers of these two. There's an interesting story where Jesus is traveling through, and he's actually rejected by this town in Samaria. And James and John immediately are like, hey, yeah, they rejected you. That's not cool of them. We should, we should cry out to God and ask for him to rain down fire on that city, you know, like he did in Sodom and Gomorrah. Hence the name Sons of Thunder. James and John were also the ones who it says that their mom came to Jesus and asked if, they, her, her, if her sons could be on his right and left side when he's on the throne. How embarrassing would that be? You picture them like, Mom, don't embarrass me in front of Jesus. 
Right? So that's, that's James and John. Um, and so Peter, James, and John make up kind of the, the inner three. These are the three, that out of, out of the 12, these are the three that Jesus spent the most time with. These were the three that would get to witness his transfiguration later on. Um, but specifically for John, um, John, was, John was the favorite of the group. He's the one that, it says that the, the one whom Jesus loves is, is actually described of him. And uh, he would go on to be, or, well, he's, he was the only disciple to be present at the crucifixion and also the only disciple to not be martyred. Coincidence? I don't think so. Um, but he would, later in life, he would be exiled by the Roman emperor to a small island off of Greece called Patmos, and it was during that time of exile that he would write the Gospel of John, um, three letters, as well as the book of Revelation. And then, again, history tells us that once that emperor died, uh, the next one came in and actually released John, where he returned to the city of Ephesus, where he stayed and pastored until his death somewhere around 100 A.D. Um, we have uh, Andrew, who is the brother of Peter, and according to John, the one who brought Peter to Jesus. Um, and Andrew, it is believed that he preached around the region of the Black Sea and kind of north of that, which would be modern-day Ukraine and Russia. Uh, then we have Philip, who's known as Philip the Evangelist. He went to Hierapolis, which is in modern-day Turkey, and possibly to the region of uh, Persia, which is modern-day Iran. Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, traveled to Armenia and possibly made it as far as India. We have Matthew, who's also referred to as Levi the tax collector. We spent a whole sermon just on Levi a few weeks ago. Um, but he would go on not only to write the gospel of Matthew, but it is believed that he preached in Persia, again, Iran, um, Egypt, and all the way down into Ethiopia, which is where he was killed um, by the king's guards down there in Ethiopia. Um, Thomas. Thomas is often known as Doubting Thomas because of the story after the resurrection. Thomas was the only one not present when Jesus first appeared to his disciples. And when all the rest of the disciples came to Thomas, he's like, hey, Jesus is alive. You have to come see him. And he's like, no way. I won't believe it until I get to actually like place my fingers in the holes where they put the nails. And so then Jesus shows up and he's like, here you go, Thomas. Um, and so Thomas gets kind of a bad rap, right? He had, he had one bad moment, and now 2,000 years later, we're still calling him Doubting Thomas, which I don't know if that's completely fair, because there are other instances in the gospel where Thomas does seem to show great faith and courage. Um, but Thomas actually traveled all the way to India, where legend has it that while he was there, he converted a doubting king, God has a sense of humor. Um, so from uh, Thomas, we go to James, the son of Alphaeus. Again, so there's two James, and they, they distinguish. They didn't have last names. So right, the son of Alphaeus is to distinguish him from the other James. He's also called James the Lesser sometimes, uh, mostly just because he didn't do quite as much as the other James. We don't know a ton about him other than he did most of his ministry around Jerusalem. Then we go on to Thaddeus. Uh, Thaddeus is also known as Judas, the son of James. So there's two, uh, two, J or two Jameses and now two Judases. Um, Judas was a very common name in ancient Israel. Uh, in the, a few hundred years before that, there was a famous guy named Judas Maccabeus who led some revolts against the, the Greeks. If you want to learn more about that, come to the deep end this month, and we're going to talk about that time frame between the Old Testament and New Testament. But all that to say that there were, that was a very common name. Um, and so his Greek name was Thaddeus. And uh, given whom he shares a name with, it's easy to see why he would want to be remembered after the fact as Thaddeus and not be confused with the other guy. Um, but he preached in Armenia, or Armenia along with Bartholomew. 
Then we get to Simon the Zealot. This is an interesting one. Um, Zealots refer to a specific group within Judaism that were like radical separatists. Uh, they hated Rome because they viewed them as their oppressors and their, their captors. And so they, they fought for the independence of Israel. And they were known to actually carry daggers up their sleeves. And so if they ever came across a Roman uh, soldier or like an, a Roman official, they would try to assassinate them. And Jesus chooses one of these guys to become his follower on the same team as Levi, the tax collector, who is known as a traitor to the Romans, right? There's no other situation in which these two people would ever want to work together. Uh, But it's just one of an infinite number of examples of how the gospel brings restoration and forgiveness and how it it can bring people together. Uh, Then we move on to Judas Iscariot. Um, Iscariot, again, they didn't have last names. Um, That meant that he was from the town of Cariot. And uh, so it says, who betrayed him? And so it's it's fascinating to think about Jesus, who is all-knowing, intentionally chose Judas to to live with him amongst the 12 and to travel with him, knowing that Judas was going to be the one who would betray him. And the reason that he did that is because he understood that Judas played a very important role in his father's will for his life and that Judas was going to be the one that would bring on his execution, resurrection, and therefore our redemption. Um, So Judas, after he sold out Jesus, he basically immediately went out and committed suicide in the gospel, or in, in sorry, in Acts chapter one, uh, it tells us that the apostles took it upon themselves to replace Judas with a man named Matthias because they recognized the 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 symbolism of having twelve. Like we're down to eleven, so let's let's bring in another one. So they they chose a very godly man named Matthias. Um, however, it is my personal opinion that I don't think God intended for Matthias to be the 12th apostle. I believe that he was saving that that empty spot for Paul, who would come a few years later, who would be known as the apostle to the Gentiles. And Paul's travels are very well documented in the book of Acts. That's three quarters of the book of Acts is just about the travels of Paul. But so there we have it. We have Jesus chose 12 ordinary and unlikely men And he called and equipped them to carry out his mission. Keep in mind that in the three years that Jesus ministered, he never left Israel, which for a comparison is roughly the size of the state of New Jersey. Meaning that Jesus never preached outside of like a hundred mile radius. But what he did was he equipped these men to take that gospel and to take it across the entire world. Um, So I know I I read to you the destinations of where a lot of these people um, ended up, but I think it's far more impactful to see it with your eyes. So I I hope you can see that. I know it may be far away. Um, I was going to try to make a map, but I came across this one that did far better of a job than I could ever make myself. But when you look at all of the places that these 12 men were able to reach with the gospel, do you think Jesus' mission was successful? Yeah. And here's the cool part the way that Jesus taught them was meant to be replicated into other people. So each of these people would go on to have more disciples that they would send out, and then more disciples after that, and the process continued. And that's how the gospel has survived for 2,000 years and reached every continent. Um, right? And even another encouraging part is that that's the same model that he has for us today, 
right? Things haven't really changed in 2,000 years, that we're expected to do the same thing, that we're expected to make more disciples and to send more people out and to go out and to share the gospel. Um, a couple years ago, actually, shortly after I got here, I think it was January of 2021, so a little more than three years ago, I preached a sermon series called The Life Cycle of a disciple where we compared our spiritual development to our physical development. And the Bible says that all of us start off, right, before we're saved, we are spiritually dead, right? We are dead to our trespasses and sins, right? And then when somebody cares about us enough to share the gospel with us, Jesus says that we are now born again. But when you're born spiritually, it's an awful lot like when you're born physically. You are a newborn infant that is incapable of really doing anything on your own. You're ignorant to just about everything of what the Bible says and how we're supposed to live. And so it requires somebody to take your hand and to teach you how to do all of these things. And then you, as you grow, you begin to learn a little bit more and you get that really awkward adolescent stage where you think you know everything, but you still don't, right? But you have to go through this and grow a little bit more. And then what we would consider spiritual maturity or spiritual adulthood is when you have the realization that, oh, this isn't just about me, but I need to serve other people because that's what Christ is calling me to do. And so you're a spiritual adult when you begin to discover what are my spiritual gifts and how can I get plugged into the church and start using those for the benefits of the church. And so you're serving and you're, 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 you're evangelizing and you're doing all of these things. But then there's a final stage where you realize that you know what, I can accomplish a whole lot more if I replicate this into other people. And now you go from being just a disciple to a disciple maker. And this is what Jesus modeled for us throughout his entire ministry, is teach other people how to do the same thing. Right? And so this is, this is what the entire Christian life is about. It's about this journey of growing and maturing in our faith and then turning around and helping other people to do the same. So it doesn't matter what stage of, of this spiritual journey you're in, right? There's always room to grow and to take that next step. So if you've never put your faith in Jesus, if you don't know where you're going to spend eternity, please come talk to me after the service, and I'd be very happy to show you how you can know today where you will spend eternity and how you can become a child of God. But if you're new to this Christian thing, it's time to start learning. It's time to start growing, right? So maybe we go beyond just learning once a week, right? And so the essential thing that you have to do is get in your Bible and start reading, and then beyond that, there's lots of other resources that you can go to. You can come to a class. You can join Dave's class on Sunday, that meets uh, before the service on Sunday mornings as they're going through in the book of Romans right now. Um, I have a small group that, that meets on Tuesday nights. You can join us. You can come to the deep end. There's lots of online resources that you can do. You need to just soak up as much as you can about the word of God. And then you're thinking, okay, I'm starting to get a hold of this Christian thing. I, start, I know what I'm supposed to do and what next. The next step is get involved and serve and serve somewhere. Well, how has God uniquely gifted you to fit into this church? Take on some responsibility, right? Find, find a way that you can contribute to the mission of this church. And if you're already doing that, now it's time to start thinking about how can I help other people to do the same? Right? How can I, maybe, maybe you recognize somebody that has similar spiritual gifts as you, and you take them under your wing and say, this is how I do everything. Maybe if, you have a, if you've been married for a long time and have a strong marriage, find a, a younger couple and just pour into them and, and be there as an encourager to them. By the way, being a disciple maker does not mean inviting, inviting people to church. That's not the same thing. That may be the first step and an important step there, but it has to go further than that. It involves really like reaching your arm, or wrapping your arm around somebody, pouring into them, encouraging them, praying with, for them and with them. It means teaching them how to do things, right? It's, it's 
you're there to celebrate the highs and you're there to weep with them at the lows, right? It means you have to really like get into the trenches with them and live life alongside of them. That's where real discipleship happens. But this is the goal for every Christian that we should reach a point where we realize it's not just about me, but it's how I can replicate this in other people. That's what makes strong Christians. If you, are, if you feel happy with where you are at in your walk with Jesus today, it's probably because at least one, if not many people, cared about you enough to come and pour into your life for a long period of time. We need to make sure that we are doing the same to other people, right? That is our responsibility as Christians, is to pour into other people, to encourage other people. That's what Jesus did with the 12, and then they turned around and did that with more and more and more. And so just think about how this works out, right? Now we're not adding to the church, we're multiplying the church. If, if we just, if we round down, say well, there's, there's an even 50 people in this church today, if over the next year, every one of you took one person and poured into them for a year straight, we'd be at 100 people next year, and we'd be looking at going to two services. And then, if we start the process over, and for the following year, now all of us, the new people included, take another person, now we're at 200 people, and we won't fit in this building. And we'll have to look into building an addition onto this, which I don't even want to think about, because that would hurt my brain. Right? And then we go to 400, and then 800, and then 1,200 people. And now we're just four or five years down the road. Don't quote my math. I don't do math. I do Bible. Right? That's how the church works. Obviously, that's, a, that's an ideal scenario. Um, right? But this is, this is what Jesus modeled for us, that we're supposed to replicate ourselves into other people, and that way we can accomplish far more than we ever can alone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for just for your love and your grace. And we look at the example of these 12 men, these, these ordinary, uneducated men that nobody else in society would have ever thought would have amounted to anything. And yet they're the men that you used to create a movement that would change history forever. And that would reverberate all the way down to us here today, uh, halfway around the world, 2,000 years later, still worshiping you and still celebrating the same gospel. I pray that you would give us the, the desire and the drive to follow through on that mission that was handed down so long ago and that we would continue that today. Give us the opportunities to, to love people and to serve people and to come alongside of people. Give us the, the wisdom on how to, to handle things. And, and as we get involved in people's lives, it means we have to deal with people's messes. And that's just part of the job. Give us the, the patience and the endurance to follow through on this, this difficult but incredible task that you have given us. And we just, we thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.